On Larry King Now, UFO whistleblower Bob Lazar, joined by filmmaker Jeremy Corbell. There's a lot of weird stories, incorrect information, and strange comments that's been passed around the internet for decades. And it just kind of reached a point where it was time to set something straight. There were 25, 27 forensic agents with a truck there for paperwork. I don't know. We don't really care. We just know now that our conversations are not private. Element 115 is a, it's a unique element. When it's exposed to radiation, it produces its own gravitational field. And it's certainly nothing that occurs here or naturally. And it can be weaponized, and that's kind of the issue here. Plus, so you're a believer. Well, there's no question. It's as real as your coffee cup is to me. <laughs> so all next on Larry King Now. Welcome to Larry King Now. Today we welcome Bob Lazar and filmmaker Jeremy Corbell. Bob is known for his 1989 account of what he says was his time at a secret military base near Area 51. It's where he says he reverse-engineered alien spacecraft. Area 51 quickly became synonymous with UFOs and a subject of extreme curiosity for many. Lazar has remained silent for 30 years until now. He recounts his story to Jeremy Corbell in a new film called Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Sources. It's currently available for digital download and on demand. All right, Jeremy, all these years later, why'd you do this film? My mentor in journalism is a man named George Knapp. And actually, George Knapp broke the story with Bob in 1989, and he's been great to me and helped me open the story back up. And Bob was willing, after 30 years, to let me make the first documentary film ever on his story. Why did you agree to do it, Bob? Well, there's a lot of weird stories, incorrect information, and strange comments that's been passed around the Internet for decades. And it just kind of reached a point where it was time to set something straight. So this film sets... Are you happy with the film? Yeah, I am. I am. It you, wasn't a smooth road, though. No, that's, why? that's correct. Because, um, look, this brought back up to Bob, there, whether you believe his story or not, which I don't think he cares anymore, it, it brought back up all these feelings and emotions. It wasn't a good time for him. The UFO subject has not been good to Bob. You watch my film, you see what he's gone through. Why is he laughed at? Uh, I think it, I don't know if he cares he's laughed at, but I think that people just get it wrong. So they've been propagating a mythology about an important story. Oh, but what, what happened to you? Well, in 1989, I was hired uh, by, uh, actually it was EG&G where I got the job. And it was the Department of Naval Intelligence that actually employed me. And our job was to back engineer an alien spacecraft that was housed at Area S-4, which is just south of Area 51. On, in that job, my specific task was to analyze the propulsion and power system. Now, the information there was compartmentalized, so were there other groups dealing with the metallurgy of the craft? How had the craft groups? gotten there? That I don't know. I mean, my own gut feeling was it was more of an archaeological type find. But... Um, I really have no information on how they originated there. And what did you learn from your knowledge? Well, I, the, the scope of the project was to see if we could duplicate the technology with available materials. And the bottom line of the whole project was we couldn't. We couldn't even duplicate, you know, some of the most basic systems in the craft. Nothing was, there was no wiring connecting anything. Um, what I assumed to be metal wasn't even metal. It appeared to be more of an advanced ceramic, so... Uh, we were able to find out how some things operated, but as far as duplicating anything back then... Uh, so did that make you an extreme believer? Yeah, because I was quite a step, uh, skeptic before. So uh, this was really the only thing, having my hands on the equipment, that could have possibly made me a believer. When they told you, here's what we have, what did you think? Well, they didn't say it exactly like that. When I first came in there and saw the craft, I thought, well... This explains all the UFO sightings. This is just an advanced fighter we're working on with an exotic propulsion system, and they've been testing it, and this is what people have been seeing for decades. And, um, you know, they slowly let me into the project as far as what's going to be going on. I said, well, we have to find out how this works. So you guys didn't build this? No. And that, it kind of went on from there. Do you believe Bob all the time? Yeah, 100%. Why would he lie? 
Well, that's the whole thing people don't understand. You know, uh, you have to get part of my movie is showing who Bob is for you to get an understanding. Because if you don't know who Bob is, you dehumanize him, and by dehumanizing him, you c you can dismiss the message. But the moment you get to meet Bob and get to know him, it's really hard not to completely understand that he is telling you exactly the way it went down, no matter if you can accept it or not. Area 51, we did a show from there years ago. You did. In 1994, you did a show out of Rachel, Nevada, outside of Area 51. And the reason you, you were there, Rachel, is because of Bob's story in 1989. That's what made Area 51 this household name that spread everywhere. So thank you for doing that show. It was powerful. And most people on that show, they, they only knew about it because Bob had said it. So we've come full circle. So now we're at a place where, thank you for doing that. And now we're at a place where we can kind of go deep now. We can go deeper. Now, what does the government say, UFOs, if I were to talk to a government agency? Actually, I think it's kind of changed now. I mean, back then it was, we stopped investigating UFOs back in the 60s with Project Blue Book, if I'm, I recall, and they yeah. denied everything. But there have been recent developments that I don't really follow UFOs at all, but uh, Jeremy You don't? Has. No, I'm actually, believe it or not, I'm not interested in the topic. I don't follow UFO stories. I was just privileged to be part of the technology research that I'm fascinated in. But uh, no, all, all the other stuff, I even have a hard time believing most of the UFO stories. Did you take pictures of this craft? No, that I couldn't get away with. Are there pictures of this craft? Well, there were, I did have, after I left the project, I did still know some of the test flight times. So there were several occasions that I did tell friends about it secretly, and we drove out to the desert and at night and filmed some of the test flights. So it was far away. Test, it, did it fly? Oh, yeah. If you don't know how it worked, how were you able to fly? How were you able to fly it? Well, you know, my analogy to that is you can get a, a motorcycle and drop it off in Victoria Times with the keys in it. Now, given time, they'll play around with it, push buttons, eventually turn the key, and over time they'll be proficient at driving it and using it. But once it runs out of fuel, it's going to stop working. And when it comes right down to it, that can't even fabricate a plastic fender on the thing. So that's exactly where we and, were. And to be clear, he didn't fly one. He never said no, he no, did. No, he no, he no. walked into one, the one he was working on. That's when he said it was an ominous feeling. He stepped in and the way he described it to me in the film is nothing was made for us. This Seats were too small. Do we see the craft in the film? Oh, you do, actually. Um, there's a, from one of the test flights, it's horrible video over black with this, this little dot of white light, you know, 1989. So, but you do see something flying in the sky. Was, was there a pilot on the flight? Yeah, there was. Oh, I only know that because I was in the hangar when the craft was flying and I heard communication back and forth. Did it look like a flying, like a round thing? Oh, yeah, it absolutely did. When we return, Bob and Jeremy discuss the FBI raid on Bob's home during the filming of the documentary. What were they looking for? You don't want to miss this. We'll be right back on this edition of Larry King Now. The film is Bob Lazar, Area 51, and Flying Saucers. The guests are Bob Lazar and the director of the film, Jeremy Corbell. What, is the government watching you, Bob? I didn't think they were after 30 years, but, um, you know, due to recent events, I would probably change. What happened? <laughs> Jeremy and I had a private conversation out in a remote area of my property. Uh, cell phones in our pockets, but turned off. All filmed. And filming it. And um, Jeremy was down there to film some of this documentary. He left the following morning, and simultaneously there was an FBI raid at my place a of raid. business. A yeah. raid? Looking for what? Well, they said they were looking for uh, some receipts from uh, an individual that might have bought some toxic material from a company. But they came with more people than you could really think would even fit in our building. I mean, agency after agency, um, you know, computer experts pulling information off the computers. and. What do you think they were there for? Well, what do you think, Jeremy? They, they, they were able to repeat back verbatim a portion of the conversation that we thought were, was private, and that shocked us because we were joking that nobody even cared 30 years later what he says, but apparently it's not as it appears. There were 25, 27 forensic agents with a truck there for paperwork. I don't know. We don't really care. We just know now that our conversations are not private. Well, what, FBI, what about this is a crime? 
They're looking for some of the fuel from the craft that might have been stolen. Element 115 was always something Bob said fueled the craft, a stable version. And to be direct, which Bob is being direct right now, they were looking to see if he had any of that taken out of Los Alamos where they machined it, which he did say back in 1989 or so that he did get some out to do tests on. And in fact, in my film, you do see something, which is a f tape that had been lost for, for 30 years, but I found it between some Golden Girls episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it bug you know why the FBI? Of course it does. It's actually the I second time. I understand the Air Force or a space lab. Well, it wasn't just the FBI. There were other organizations there, too. Multi-organizations came in that. The FBI what, is is our, what do you think our government is testing? What do you think they're looking for? Well, they're, I, they're looking for high technology. They're looking for as advanced technology as they can possibly have. And look, anybody that controls technology this advanced would control the world. It's a very, very powerful weapon. And uh, I, I think that's the bottom line. What's element 115? Element 115 is a, a super heavy element. It's something that we only, only just recently synthesized. We only made four atoms of it. But um, the craft uses larger quantities of it, 223 gram little triangles of it. But it's a unique element. When it's exposed to radiation, it produces its own gravitational field, its own anti-gravitational field, and it's what's used to lift and propel the craft and create distortions around it. It's, a, it's an amazing material, and it's certainly nothing that occurs here or naturally. And it can be weaponized, and that's kind of the issue here. If this story is all true, that can be weaponized. Absolutely. Was, were any personnel found on the object when it got here? I don't know personally. You know, I like to differentiate between the things that I was able to verify and had hands-on experience and things that I was just about, you know, allowed to read about. Now, I did read briefings that they did have an autopsy of a creature. Now, whether or not it was in the craft, but the way the information was split up, there were different groups. We all had one or two page briefings on what the other groups were doing in case they connected to us, but there was no communication between the groups so they can keep things separate. But the but, people investigating this were very serious, right? Oh, very much so. Did they tell you not to say anything? Oh, they made that very clear. Yeah. Why did you go public? That's a long, well, the involved short, story. The short of it is that you, he was afraid for his life. Why? It had to do with my relationship at the time and the security clearance, one of the things was, was you had to have not only no connection to foreign governments and a standard top secret clearance, but as you probably know with all high security clearances, you have to have a stable home life too. Well, there were things going on at home. They had my phone line monitored and I was a candidate for an unstable family life, as they <laughs> called it. Did they try to label you as nuts? No, not nuts. They in fact wanted me back in the project very badly but they didn't know if I was going to be too stressed out to keep things quiet. And I started getting concerned when we started getting followed every place I went to. That's the only time that I finally started telling a couple friends, hey, if I disappear, this is what I was doing. And when I took them out to the site to show them. Next, what the Pentagon is saying today about UFOs and the possibility of life on another planet. The documentary film is Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Saucers. It's available to stream now. Don't go away. We're back with Bob Lazar and Jeremy Corbell. Uh, people have not been able to verify some things about Bob Lazar, specifically your education. You say that you hold a degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the California Institute. Investigations say they can't find records of that. How do you respond to all that? I did go to those universities. I did also work at Los Alamos and other research facilities that said I never have worked there. And there has been a concerted effort to essentially re erase my background, which is exactly what Jeremy's film covers. Something puzzling about all of this, Jeremy, is yeah. why does the government hide this? Well, what, so we all believe, most people believe in extraterrestrials. Right. Most people, so what are, you, what are they afraid of? We're living in a different world now. Since December of 2017 with Commander David Fravor, the Tic Tac UFO case, which I broke before the New York Times. I reported on that twice. 
That case opened the door, so we now know the government did not stop studying UFOs in 1969. There's a program called ATIP. That program is now acknowledged. So what, what, are, what are they afraid of? I think they're afraid of weaponization. I think that's the issue here. And also, you're right, we're not, we're not alone in the universe, but are they visiting here? And, and that's the question that they've been unwilling well, I always said it's why don't they just release information that these events occurred and they can keep the technology secret. That I've never understood, so I'm with you on that. Why are they afraid of you? What are you going to tell us? The, the just what I did, <laughs> the, the existence of the project. All right. Why, why are they so afraid they, of that? I, I don't, you'd have to ask them that. Why do you think, Jim? What are they afraid of? You know, I, I, we, we, I don't really know. I think that it's a big concept, Larry. It's a big concept that we're not alone and that we're being visited. And in 1989, that's explosive. To this day, we're in a different world. I do believe that what has come out by the Pentagon, the videos by Commander Fravor, that they admitted there are unknown aerial objects of advanced technology that are in fly with impunity in our airspace. It is now admitted by our government. If people don't know that, they now need to know that. We're in a different world. I'm very optimistic. What's at Area 51? Area 51 is a large test facility. It's not where this occurs. This occurs slightly south of it. But Area 51 tests advanced... I mean, we went there, but you could only go to a certain spot, and then you had to, couldn't go farther. Yeah, they test advanced air... conventional advanced aircraft, and they even have some foreign aircraft there that they analyze and... So there's a, and it's a much larger facility. There are thousands of people that work there, but there's you know no alien. How did they technology. get there? They flown in these people. They drive. That's a well, he, strange he was, place. He was flown in on the Janet flights, right? And he'd stop at Area 51, but he didn't work at Area 51. They then put him on a bus and took him south of Groom Lake to Papoose Lake at Site S4, which right. George Knapp confirmed in 1989 that that base, that location S4, existed. Now wait a minute. Are all these people working on all these things sworn to secrecy. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, they can't even tell their wives or their husbands what they're doing. This sounds bizarre. But it's true. Well, they this is five. normal, run-of-the-mill, top-secret stuff. That's not even the alien stuff. Who are they working... When they get a paycheck, who does it come from? That, that varies. I mean, when I worked at Los Alamos, my paycheck came from uh, University of California. I worked at S4. My paycheck came from the Department of Naval Intelligence. You would think it would be the Air Force or something like that. So it's, it's very difficult. It's a very convoluted situation. Did they tell you why you couldn't speak out? No, no. They just say this is highly classified information and, and that's it. But, you know, every one of the thousands of people involved at any secret facility, whether it be Tonopah Test Range, the Nellis Range, Area 51, all go through the exact same thing. Why do you think these people who can build these superior things haven't come here? But they have come here. And I know, I know, but they land in Billings, Montana. Why don't they come to New York? Right, so they do, go, <laughs> they do come to New York. Um, there's actually, there's a mass phenomenon that has been going on since the beginning of recorded human history where these things engage human beings on multitudes of levels, from lights in the skies, which is the most famous part, to close encounters. So my argument is they have made themselves clearly available you know, they haven't come on your show yet, Larry, but let's get that to happen. A half of Americans believe in UFOs, right? More than that's half, what I hear. Yeah. And that's based on what? I mean, for me, it was 1989 and Bob Lazar telling his story. That's what weaponized my curiosity about it. Have you ever seen one? I have never seen something that I can definitively say is a flying saucer. I have seen incredible light shows in the sky. Has the government ever looked at this? Have we ever had congressional committees. I've heard about them trying to form one, but I, d I don't know if that actually follows. Like I said, I don't really follow. Jimmy yes, Carter so said he saw one. Oh, yeah. Uh, so he was president. Couldn't he have had something happen then? A lot of presidents, such as even the Clintons, have tried officially to get this information out to the public and have been shut down. Now, I just want to clarify, Bob is not a UFO guy. He doesn't follow UFO news. You ask about congressional hearings. Uh, I held with a friend the citizen hearing on disclosure. We had five congressmen, one senator, and 40 witnesses from around the world testify at the National Press Club about this. And guess what? That made a big splash. And guess what's happening now? Since December of 2017 and the Tic Tac UFO case with Commander David Fravor, they are now, from what I understand, looking to do more hearings. Maybe closed, maybe open, but there is a ball in motion for this. And that's what's kind of exciting. Our boy, you saw the vehicle, Bob. Yeah. You went in, you looked at it, you inspected it. What do you believe? 
I believe that's that, as I said, that's incredibly advanced technology. I don't understand how any of it was fabricated. Like I told Jeremy and others, it's, it was completely unnatural looking. There are no sharp corners anywhere. Everything is one single color as if the, the craft was fabricated out of wax and allowed to melt a bit. Everything has a slight radius of curvature to it. It's very unusual. The way the device operates is, is mind-boggling. So you're a believer. Well, there's no question. It's as real as your coffee cup is, to me. <laughs> when we come back, Bob and Jeremy will answer your social media questions. Bob Lazar Area 51 and Flying Saucers is available to stream now. Stay right there. Our guests are uh, Bob Lazar and Jeremy Corbell. I can't wait to see this documentary. We have some social media questions. Working Animal on Twitter. Has there been any fallout for you, Bob, and your business as a result of the FBI raid? No, not yet. I'm kind of bracing for some fallout from the movie. What is your business? Uh, I own United Nuclear, a scientific, uh, uh, scientific equipment and supply uh, company. And we do some prototyping work, sell all varieties of scientific equipment. You make money from this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that I do. You told me during the break that you took a picture of one of the beings. No, 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 no. I didn't, didn't take a picture of one. That was, in a, uh, that was in a briefing from a group, that uh, separate group at the facility. What did they look like? Actually, it looks like your, your typical thin body. It's just a very, remember, the picture was just of the chest area, so it was a, a very small body, um, thin head, and... Uh, I guess gaunt is the only way I could describe it. Ken Sobers on Twitter. Bob, if a spacecraft distorted space-time in order to travel massive distances, assuming they don't make any arduously large number of tiny jumps, would you expect such distortion to cause detectable gravity waves? I actually, ask that question, yes. I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> yes, I, actually, I, I would, depending on the direction the craft is traveling. Yeah, I would imagine we would be able to detect some gravity waves from that. Black Rose 48778 on Twitter. What is your theory of the reasons why aliens come to Earth and leave? I know maybe it's like uh, you know, they, they love our music or they, you know, it's tourism, alien tourism. I don't know. Uh, Bob read something really strange and disturbing in the briefings that we have no place to put it, that they referred to human beings as containers, which is the weirdest thing you could ever hear. This is something that was read in the briefings. He has no other information about it, but I don't know. Why are they visiting here? Maybe it's our charming personality. Which has always bugged me about this, and I've talked about this forever. Why don't they land in Washington? This is a guess. Go to the Capitol, on the Capitol steps, and communicate. Well, you're assuming they're on the same level with us. When have you ever stopped on the side of the road and pulled over and decided to try and communicate with a bunch of cattle on the side of the road. You know, I, I think they're just on a completely different level. You never take the time to stop and try and talk to an anthill. I, I just think they're just in a completely different level, and it's, uh, there's, we're something to observe and so maybe have some use, but I don't think there are any... They're looking at us, right? Yeah. Yeah, they certainly are, and they have been for a long time. Black Rose asks... What is the purpose of scientific people keeping their knowledge hidden about aliens? What's, why, what is the purpose that scientific people would keep it hidden? I don't know why they keep the information about the aliens hidden. I, you know, in the, previously they said, well, it would cause panic and upset people, but I don't believe that holds no. true anymore. And I can see why they keep the technology secret. That's you know, obviously military, but... I really don't know why they don't come clean and tell us what's going yeah. on. Ricky Merchant on Twitter. Given that stability seems important for such a heavy element, was there a lot of effort put to, in to deduce which isotopes were present? Well, we, but that's kind of, and how did we determine what the element was? I mean, we ran all kinds of tests on it, and uh, everything from atomic absorption and... Uh, uh, X-ray X -ray fluorescence and, you know, every kind of test you could possibly imagine um, and bombarded it with radiation to see what effects it would have. They call that neutron activation. Um, 
and we tried to come up with other isotopes and you know accidentally did ourselves but it was a stable element um, and something we had never seen before Pavelis Slitka Bob on Twitter what do you, do you think blowing a whistle on what was going on saved your life well, I think it helped out. I hope it did. I hope this wasn't. Why a would they thing. want to kill you? Well, I was at, well. Once I took friends out to the site to view some of the tests, we got caught at one time, and it was it kind of all went downhill from there. Immediately after that is when I went public with it and uh, just thought that was an insurance policy. He didn't want to go public. He's a reluctant UFO messiah. George Knapp pulled him and said, "This is going to help you to protect yourself," and I think. He achieved that. Patty Jackson on Facebook asked two questions. She was at the premiere in December. Okay. How big were the spacecrafts from Area 51 that the reverse engineering was done on? I think it was about 52 feet in diameter. And approximately how many beings could these spacecraft hold? Three. Boy, someday we'll have all the answers. I hope so. Thank, Thank you, Larry. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Bob. Big thanks to my guests, Bob Lazar and Jeremy Corbell, for joining me on this fascinating discussion into a subject that still captivates many. You can learn more about it in the documentary Bob Lazar, Area 51 and Flying Sources, currently on demand and streaming. As always, you can find me on Twitter at King's Things. I'll see you next time.